and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy. And here I'm recording this on the 17th of June 2024 and it's almost summer solstice. So for you um, people who are stuck up there in the far north of the world, happy solstice, almost anyway. And um, here I am near the equator, surrounded by all these lovely bunch of coconuts and all these avo bananas, right? And for me, well, there's not really much of a solstice for me. I'm in this permanent state of equinox at the moment. Uh, the skies are grey because um, this is kind of becoming the beginning of the rainier or wetter season that we're in at the moment. But I actually like this because, um, you know, it's still, the temperature is still quite hot, although it cools down a little bit into the high 20s <laughs> when uh, we get these grey skies. It's actually quite nice to be in the tropics when it's uh, been raining and it's cloudy. You know, it does make a, it's a huge relief because the sun can be a little bit too much here, you know. Mind you, I hear you pull bastards up in the far north of the world, especially those of you in, in Gurland, are not having a summer at the moment, but yet you're being gaslit about global warming and how it's been the warmest May um, ever. And um, not that anyone had ever noticed, but that's how stupid it's all getting now, isn't it? Right, so I want to call this episode um, Far Right Derangement Syndrome, right? And because uh, I think there's a good phrase, why not call it that? Yes. And it all comes down to, uh, if you look at the world now, if you look at, it's June. Now, June's an interesting month because, um, again, you know, you've got, uh, you got Pride Month. I'm just thinking how, what you need now is um, six other uh, deadly sins and name a month after them. You can have like Sloth Month and Gluttony Month, Greed Month, Lust Month, you know, that sort of thing. Um, that'd be a good idea, wouldn't it? You know, because then it'll put it all into perspective and pride or hubris is supposed to be the worst of those deadly sins according to uh, the uh, Christian doctrine. Right, so that aside, um, <clears throat> what I want to talk about today, of course, is the fact that all you have to do is look at those who are guarding all the doors, keeping all the gates, holding all the keys in society, in the Western world, from corporations and the HR departments of corporations to um, governments, to the mainstream media, to pretty much everyone that there is who is trying to set the narrative. And what do you find at least since in the last, uh, getting on for 10 years, how much it's gone further and further and further and further to the left? And it has, it's become very far left to the point where there is a real risk of totalitarianism um, coming in and taking away people's voices. And now we are seeing a, a fight back against this. And you know, me being the sort of person who does not get fixed in any ideological place politically, being someone who is liminal in, it, in his thinking, uh, between spaces, um, I am not really swayed one way or the other. I mean, for me, back in the time of the, uh, you know, back, back in the 80s and into the early 90s, it was very clear to me that it was the right-wing people that were trying to censor everyone's morals and the left-wing were a little bit more, uh, um, I have to say, they were a bit more loose, they were a bit more pro-libertarian, they were a bit more pro-freedom of speech back then. And um, now it seems to have flipped and gone the opposite way. It seems to me that uh, when any group of people uh, find themselves on the back foot, when any group of people find themselves being the marginalised ones, the actual true marginalised ones, not, not, the, not the ones that they tell you are marginalised, incidentally, um, they take on the countercultural form. Now the problem is, of course, is that, uh, you know, uh, I've seen how people kind of get stuck in narratives. I've been stuck in false dichotomies before. I was stuck in um, what I called uh, the dichotomy of um, mainstream versus alternative and thinking that I was alternative and that the normies were mainstream. Well, one of the things I realized was that like, I didn't actually fit in with the alternative people myself fully entirely and I didn't really know why. And it didn't make much sense to me why. But in these last, um, say, eight years, especially since uh, 2016, a lot of this stuff has become quite clear to me. Now I'm trying to work something out about, uh, I'll give you an example. When you see every corporate logo having to have rainbows on it um, at this time of the year, when you see um, how it is that you won't get as, in as much trouble for waving a Palestinian flag as you will for waving an England flag, right, for instance, when you can't get an England flag or a Union Jack out in the UK without being told you're far right, but you can actually walk around with a Palestinian flag with um, uh, some, I don't know, a symbol of Hamas on it, and you're not, um, 
you're not called far left or you're not even called a terrorist, right? Because again, you know, the thing about all of this is that it's all down to, yeah, diversity, equity and inclusion. So there's all these people who are protected in all of this sort of stuff, which means that if you're not in the protective dead bracket, you are an outcast. Now, the indigenous people of the UK are more outcasted than anyone else, and especially those who don't um, follow the script, the narrative, and we all know this now. But we also know that when um, people of an ethnic background, whether they be black or whether they be Asian or whatever they are, or even if they're gay or even if they're other, whatever you want to say, and they all decide that they're not going to follow the far left doctrine, they're treated even worse than the indigenous white people. Because they're, they're like, you know, they're, 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 they're treated like traitors, like Judases, apostates of the religion that exists at the moment that, that pretty much dominates the Western world, or at least has done in the last few years. And I think it's really obvious at this point. Anyone who can't see it, I don't understand why people can't see this. The thing to bear in mind, though, as well, is that, right, you may have many um, opinions about Nigel Farage. Now, some people think he's not a real, um, you know, folk hero. Some people think he's just kind of an establishment person masquerading or posing as a folk hero. There'd be a lot of people out there that kind of like might be, you know, even more to the right of him. They like Tommy Robinson and they like Lawrence Fox, but they don't consider Nigel Farage to be the real deal. Um, there may be people out there that think, well, he's been, he's been a GB news presenter. He's been on I'm a Celebrity. He's been on, a, you know, on LBC, so therefore he can't really be a man of the people. Well, there'll be people out there that said, well, he's posh, therefore how can he relate to the working classes? Maybe they'll say he's a grifter, that he's a chancer. They'll say all sorts of things about him. Now, up to a point, I can understand people saying that about him. But after all this time, the one thing that I cannot understand, even, I just cannot understand is, how can they say he's a fascist? How can they say he's a Nazi? That's the bit I don't get. You want to tell me that he is like a, a skinhead with facial tattoos? He is like a Ku Klux Klan man with a pointy white hat? You want to tell me that he's a jackboot wearing, goose stepping, silly moustache wearing, sinister um, German? Uh, this is the man who's actually put Britain above Europe. This is the man who uh, is responsible for Brexit, whether you like it or not, of course, you know. This is a man who, um, you know, when he was working in business, uh, decided that um, actually the, the European economy would actually be bad for the country and actually foresaw something and wanted to do something about it. Now, you might not agree with it. You might not be on the political same page as him. And, you know, like I say with me, and diversity of opinion is okay, you're entitled to have um, that view. But the fact is that like now we're in this time where we have clearly got an authoritarian bunch of people on the other side, you know? And it started, as you know, with the blue-haired social justice warriors almost a decade ago, Antifa, and all of these people, people who are obsessed with, I don't know, the environment, um, gender, people, Black Lives Matter, all that sort of stuff. All of the people who have come from, and, you know, the diversity, equity, inclusion, all that lot. Um, all these people who are, you know, really zealous and, and taking on all these left-wing causes. And we just thought, oh, they're just a bunch of students, it'll die out, no, nothing will happen, right? So all these people with their lesbian dance studies and their Lady Gaga study degree who came from all these universities, then suddenly find themselves in positions like, um, you know, they're in their corporations, they're in the HR department of corporations, they're calling the shots. These people are, you know, I'm watching a video with Thomas Sheridan, he was saying that the thing about the Wokies is that they're very miserable, they hate the working class, they hate grassroots culture, they hate anyone who can laugh and can have fun, the only thing they want to do is to emiserate everyone, and that's the whole point, these bunch of <coughs> humorless thought police going around wishing to emiserate everyone who does not wholeheartedly agree with them. They are very authoritarian and definitely very totalitarian in the way that they think, right? And it's very obvious and it's very clear at this point. They come from the other side of the thing, the far left. I don't understand how it can be, with all of that going on at the moment, that anyone can think of Nigel Farage as being an absolute hardline fascist. It doesn't make any sense. Now, as I said, you can have all sorts of things about him. You can think of him in all sorts of bad ways. You can think that, you know, he's a grifter, he's a chancer, he's a media whore. You can think all these things about him. but. No, I mean, 
all we have to do is to go back and have this longer now perspective and go back to the 1940s and realize what this thing that they call the far right now is absolutely nothing to do. It's a million miles away from what the real far right are. And anyone who thinks like this is, you know, it doesn't realize it's detrimental to think like this. Because I've seen the people who I consider to be the real far right. And they were dangerous and they were sinister. And, um, you know, like I say, is there is a possibility, there's a few of them hanging around, lurking in the shadows. Um, but at the moment, the real problems that we have at the moment are, are coming from a couple of other rather zealous groups. There is, of course, as you know, radical Islamism, which is a bit of a problem because um, a lot of people out there are worried that Western countries are going to end up with Sharia law if we don't try to do anything to prevent it, to keep the freedoms that we have, at least the Western freedoms, and to keep freedom of speech and to kind of, you know, keep the continuity of things as we knew them, keep them going because, you know, yes, it might be a bit shit in the UK, and of course, you know, if you're in America, a lot of people will now think that America's quite shit, a lot of people are at each other's throats, it's very divided. But at the core of all of this was political individualism, the Magna Carta, and in the case of the United States, the Bill of Rights and the, um, you know, the, the amendments that enshrine certain freedoms into law. And the idea of political individualism, which um, was very much in the UK, democracy, which was very much in the UK, all these ideas were very sound ideas. And, um, and now that's under threat, it's under siege from, you know, something that's not unlike communism, and that's worse than, than uh, you know, and it's, it's actually at the moment having a worse effect than anything from the far right. At the same time, you've also got political Islamism, and I'm not saying Muslims, no, I want to make that clear, I'm not saying Muslims, I am saying political radical Islamism, which wants to, um, again, is very authoritarian, and if there is a problem with the far right, then I would say that that's at number three. But it's pretty insignificant. I've said this many times before. And so it amazes me that we're in this time where people can't see this. They, they are caught in a political paradigm which is akin to the 1980s and 1990s. Now remember the 1980s and the 1990s, and if I was to go back in time, in our time machine, back to the 1990s and 1980s, then I suppose I could be exactly the same as I am now, but I would probably be a little bit more to the left um, politically, or considered to be more to the left politically, than I would be now perceived in this era without being any different. And as I said to you before in the last episode with the political compass test I did, it puts me very much in a kind of moderate centrist kind of way. When I actually think about party politics and I think about the actual doctrine of politics as a concept itself, I kind of think of myself as a punk anarchist really, you know. Um, and the, the whole left and right thing is just the, like I say, I duck to the left, duck to the right to dodge obstacles and bullets. That's basically as far as it goes with me but I'm trying to keep some kind of consistent center in all of this, just to really truly understand what's going on. But anyway, this is what's happening now in Europe. Unfortunately, the UK is going in the wrong direction. The UK is gonna go full on uh, red Keir Stalin. I call him that now, that's my name for Keir Starmer, Keir Stalin. Um, we don't know what he stands for. His only political um, slogan that he's got is change, because he's a very unimaginative, uncharismatic man. We don't know what the hell's going on. I mean, he's basically the cold play of politics. He's so boring and so beige, and there's really nothing about him. But uh, then, you know, we do know, of course, there are a bunch of militant nutters in the Labour Party in the UK, and if they have too much power, and they become too big for their boots, then God help us, really, you know? That's why it helps to not be there, right? And, you know, uh, but there is this uprising and underbelly of more slightly to the right populism that is still forming in the UK. And um, there's gonna be some seismic shifts, I think, this time in British politics. It's a much harder system to change than anything that goes on in Europe. But all you have to do is look at Europe now. France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, you know, uh, and you can see that there are significant changes there. They're, even in the European Parliament, there's significant changes. They're all freaking out now because they don't like the idea that everything has shifted um, more to the right. But the thing is, this is what happens. If the far left have been trying to make, you know, they've been bringing in censorship, they've been bringing in, been cancelling people, they've been forcing, I don't know, rainbow dildos down your throat every June, 
they've been trying to tell us to be, um, you know, you, you know, they say, if a, if you come within too much close proximity to someone wearing a suicide vest and you have to run for fear of the shrapnel that will have as they take themselves out and try to take them with you, and you put it down to a certain religion, then you would probably just have to become Islamophobic by default. But now they want to make that illegal? They want to make that illegal? No, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, because I mean, like I say, all my life, ever since I was a kid, there's been these friendly Indian and Pakistani corner shop owners, and some have been Hindu, some have been Sikh, some have been Muslim. We never had problems with them. Well, maybe we said a few things we shouldn't have said, but we learnt our lesson, but they became part of the furniture, and that was okay. So when it comes to your friendly corner shop owner, one, you know, I had to say one out of every three of them may have been Muslim. If they were polite to us, we'd be polite back to them. It's not really an issue, you know, and um, that's the thing. So there isn't what you would call Islamophobia when it comes to stuff like that. I remember actually, I was um, in Cricklewood in North London around the time of 7-7. Um, and I remember talking to a few of the shop owners, I think they were Pakistani Muslim shop owners, and they were very sad about that happening. You know, they didn't want that to happen, they were very sad about that happening. I could see the tears in the eyes of one bloke who run a shop. And I kind of felt sorry for him, because I thought he's going to get a lot of hostility you know, aimed at him, right, um, that he doesn't deserve. And I remember a couple of lads having to go at this bloke on the train, and he was saying, no, I'm a Hindu. Right? So yeah, there is that. There is a chance as a result of all this hostility that some of the people on the right will um, uh, bring everything um, a little bit more to the far right if you let them. But I think because of the far left and what's happened recently, enough people are aware of this and enough people are trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. And I'd even include Tommy Robinson in it and I would include Nigel Farage in it these days. Now maybe I'm, maybe I, I've, I'm drifting a little bit too far in a direction that some people might think, oh that's bad. But you know what? I'm, I'm flexible on this and I'm going to be looking and seeing if any of these people go off track, I won't pretend they're not. I'm not in their camp, so to speak. I know that like, um, you know, it's all about pendulum swinging, but if they bring us to the, too much to the far left, then we have to go to the right in order to get back to the centre. There may be a few bad actors in it, and there's bad actors everywhere. But as I said, and I will keep them saying this, right, while all the corporations have got rainbows on their logos, not in the Middle East, but in the Western world, every June. While you cannot criticise or you have to, you know, you, you have to basically bow down to the religion of trans, you have to um, bow down to the religion of diversity, equity and inclusion, while we all are told that we're not allowed to take people on their individual merit anymore and we must judge them by their identity groups and the more um, along the, the lines of intersectionality, the, you know, uh, the more me must stop and worship them. So if you have yourself a rainbow coloured, non-binary, black, lesbian, trans, Muslim, gay, whatever, then you've got to basically um, employ them first, worship them like, like they're gods and whatever, but if you end up with someone who's a heterosexual white male, then you must um, keep away from them because they are dangerous and evil. The heterosexual white male, uh, in the case of me, well, I could just say, oh, my well, parents are Irish, it make me a little bit less despicable, but only just because I've only got one level of intersectionality in there. If, uh, if I were on the other bus, that would bring me a little bit closer, but it still would be a problem for me because I'd still be male. Yeah, I'd be all right, but I could be a white lesbian. Then, of course, I'm a little bit more up the intersectionally intersectional hierarchy at that point. But then as a bloke, well, I can't be, I can't make myself gay, and I certainly um, can't make myself female unless I could, well, I could go trans. So that's all I've got to do, go trans, you know. And then once I've done that and um, just be look like Bob the Builder in a wig or something like that, then, of course, I'll go a little bit more up the intersectional thing and I say, because my parents were foreign, then, oh, well, as that, then that's how you, you make it. So, as we have to live like this with this collectivist group mind, uh, intersectional groups, identity politics um, being there, we all have to kowtow to all of this because a bunch of white middle class people who live in the Cotswolds, who don't live amongst the ethnic minorities and who do not live anywhere near the cities and do not live anywhere near where the stabbings happen. And whenever they go to London, they're sort of straight in and out of Islington and spend most of their time in gated communities. 
who don't see the problems that your ordinary oi polloi see all the time. And incidentally, it's quite ironic, isn't it, that these people are white and middle class who are actually the, the people who are controlling this far left narrative. Most of them are, all right, there's a few that are not, right, but I mean, you know, a great deal of them are. And in order to keep their position in society, they have to kowtow to all of this, right? Well, the thing is that uh, they are slowly losing control of the narrative. Now that they've buggered up pretty much music, they've buggered up television, buggered up Hollywood, they've buggered up everything, and they've got to the point where you can't even watch Doctor Who anymore without having a, the message shoved down your throat, right? That's the thing. I don't want to watch sci-fi and just um, see everyone ticking diversity boxes. I don't want to listen to all of this woke speak. I don't want to listen to any of this woke corporate speak. I don't want to be told that this is the new world that we live in and um, you're behind the times and you have to keep up with the times now and other fallacies like that while in real life no one buys this shit. No one at all buys it. And that's what it comes down to. No one in real life buys this bollocks. <laughs> no one worth fucking talking to anyway. And if I met any of these irritatingly middle class people, the first thing I would do would say something that would alienate me so that they don't invite me to their fucking dinner parties. Who wants to go? I don't. Uh, so there you go, and then that, they can be ostracised. I don't mind ostracising myself from them because they're not the sort of people I want in my circle. Right? That's what it comes down to. And as we go into this future, um, as we see this populist uprising, I'm of the opinion that, despite the fact that there may be a few, just a tiny amount of uh, far-right people out there, the chances are, one, they're probably planted, two, they're ignorant and stupid, and a lot of the working class people now in, in the UK and around Europe now are much more informed about politics than they were and have had to deal with this woke bollocks for almost a decade now, understand that, you know, if you juxtapose yourself against them, they've done everything they can to demonstrate that they are exemplars and they're not racist, they're not sexist, they're not homophobic. But you kind of got to get to that point where you've ingrained that into yourself and you don't have to justify yourself to these far lefty gatekeepers anymore because what the hell are they doing? All they're doing is going around is falsely accusing people of being and slander and slurs and libel, you know, accusing people of, of things that they're not, purely for the, for the purpose of character assassination and cancellation, because they haven't got any arguments that they can win, none of them have. And they're just a bunch of muppets. And, um, you know, th th what the hell are they doing? We're all fed up with them. I mean, enough of us are fed up, I, am, I certainly am. I'm so fed up to the back teeth of them that it's just made me want to leave the Western world. There's none of that here in the Philippines. You know, and I like the Filipinos, they're all very nice, they're good natured, they're smiley, happy. Not, I can't remember ever seeing a single one of them um, look at me uh, in, a, in a way that I would consider to be racist. They like foreigners, they like Western people, you know, and you can't help but like them. So, you know, I mean, I'd be really stupid to be a racist white supremacist and be in a place like this, wouldn't I? I'd have to be really dumb because I, I, it was very unpleasant of me. I also have to be extremely dumb to have married one of them, right? Uh, it wouldn't work, would it, to think about it? <laughs> but the truth is that it's nice to be in a part of the world where this stuff has not completely taken over. You know, uh, there are sort of, how could I say, maybe a few laws, maybe a few rules where they're trying to bring in these things or through the media or whatever, they try to bring bits of this here, but it just doesn't stick here, that's the thing. It doesn't stick it because this is purely a Western-centric thing. And so, you know, as a result, it's good to be in this woke-free environment. But then when I look at Europe, because again, like I say, my heart's still there, and my body's not, my mind kind of still is a bit. It's where I came from, it's what defined me as an individual. You know, I am, uh, what to say, I am a Westerner, I am English, I am English or Irish, I'm both. And um, so this stuff defined me, defined who I am. But the version of that that I remember, the bits I like to remember, is from the 20th century, before this madness came along. When, uh, when we kind of knew who we were, before we forgot, you know? And it's, uh, it's a shame, because the 21st century version of the Europe that I came from um, is something I just don't recognise anymore, you know? I don't recognise it. It's really horrible to see this happen. 
And I hope that this uprising, you know, that's going to take us away from the far left is actually going to work. We'll see now. With this election that's coming up in Britain, it'd be interesting to see what happens. Now, I know I, I kind of like can't take the political classes very seriously, but this is the biggest spanner in the works that I've seen thrown into it, and I just love to see that. I just love to see spanners being thrown into the political works, because that's what makes it interesting for me, you know, more than anything else. I love seeing it ruffled like that. I like seeing the establishment running scared, you know, because they get too big for their boots, they get too complacent, they need that. So we'll see how this turns out. And, you know, there'll be the people out there who are very much stuck in the conspiracy sphere and they'll just dismiss it all. They'll say, oh, it doesn't matter. It's all pre-planned. All of it's pre-planned. Even the revolution's pre-planned. It's all the conspiracy. But no, you overestimate them. The thing is that humans are humans. And it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter how powerful people get. It doesn't matter how much influence or power people get. The thing is, if they go against the people, when they go against the people for long enough and they try to centralise too much power, they try to change the narrative and try to go against the people, a people like, you know, the Western Europeans and especially the English and the Americans who've come so accustomed to the idea of political individualism and sovereignty. It's not like that in Asia where people are more collectivists. No, it's not like that there. The idea of political individualism and sovereignty, freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, freedom of um, assembly, you know, freedom would be able to just joke whatever way you want to, have a laugh, have some banter with your mates down the pub, whatever. This stuff is so ingrained in the Western world that if you try to take that away, it will rise like a lion and all hell will break loose. And I'd like, I'm optimistic and I hope that what comes of the next few years, the next five years, will be the backlash that we've been waiting for. We shall see. Now, I don't know, maybe I'm a gullible twat and I think a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the really hardcore conspiranoid people out there, truthers, would have decided that I must be really gullible and that I'm going back to sleep and inserting myself back into the matrix. But my version of reality, I'm more hopeful than I have been for a long time. And seeing how the um, political landscape is changing in Europe away from the left is really good, really healthy as far as I can see. Now, of course, if we find ourselves in a situation where the populists turn out to be a little bit too far to the right, I will go with that too, and I will admit it if I see it. Because, um, you know, this is the time now, this world, the way it is now, is so complex. You can't allow yourself to be in fixed ideological positions. You have to find a center, and you have to have a compass, and you have to see which way the wind is blowing, and you have to adapt to it. Um, otherwise, what happens? You just get swept away. And, uh, you know, uh, we're, so, we're so vulnerable to things like confirmation bias, co uh, you know, cognitive bias, echo chambers and stuff like that. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of work for me to try to keep myself out of all of this stuff, you know, and I get swayed like everyone else does. But, you know, as I say, I've, uh, I've got a very liminal view of the world now. I want to stay liminal. So this is the thing. They talk about the somewheres, they talk about the anywheres, right? And I decided that I'm neither, I'm neither wheres, I'm a liminal um, in the middle between them all. And that's the way to be. And um, as I say, if the world changes completely, goes, does 180 degree like it had done in the past, and it does that within the next um, 20 years when I will find myself in my 70s, I will bloody say so. And I'll alienate myself from all the people who I'm al allying with now you know, who can't make that move then. Just as I'm alienating myself from a lot of the people from the alternative scenes that I knew back in the day, because they can't, because that's what I'm like. Um, you know, I don't have any fear at all of being outcasted from a tribe, because the thing about it is if you have integrity, if you have a very defined sense of the individual that you are, it doesn't matter. Those. Uh, people with integrity and with a defined sense of um, individuality will respect you no matter what. So, you know, you don't want to collect too many fair weather friends along the way. You don't want to be in the wrong tribe. You don't want to be around the wrong people. So it's good to have no fear of ostracization at a time like this. This is when we need it most. Right, I've been waffling and droning on for so long now that you're probably asleep. So I shall leave you to it. See you later, alligator. See you soon, baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. 
And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.